My name is Mike Espinoza. I have three boys. My son Ammon, last time I saw him, a beautiful red-headed little boy. The last time I saw him, he was maybe nine, and uh, right now he's 24. My son Logan, he is a blonde-haired, beautiful little boy. And my son Justice, he also is a beautiful child turning into a grown man. All three of them I haven't seen in a, in a long time. The papers were filed and she took out an order of protection against me. I went to the house pre the day before to drop off Justice and Logan. And I dropped them off and they went in the house. Now she came outside and kissed me. In my mind, I was thinking, okay, that's one step forward. We need to start working things out and protect our family. So the next day, I went also to drop Justice off. When I went to the door to drop her, I leaned in to give her a kiss just because she had given me one the day before. And uh, she shirked away from me. And I didn't understand what was you know, what, what was that for? When she wasn't happy, you know, that I wouldn't do exactly what she said. She, she then served me at McDonald's when I brought my son back. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I had no idea. Had an idea what she said on paper, but none of it was true. Silly, crazy things like, I was a danger to my children and that I had called her and told her to keep the ki kids away from me because I was not safe around them. Right, so the order of protection, because it's in place, it doesn't allow you to communicate. So I was absent without my children for this whole time period. Couldn't talk to them on the phone. Couldn't, I had no correspondence or anything with them at all. Now, the judge, Judge Michelle Rickle, came out and said that because I leaned in to kiss her, I violated her space. Previous day that that happened, she leaned in to kiss me. I just didn't shirk away. So she violated my space. So there is no equality. There is no equity. It is a lie. She took him to see a counselor, Dr. Alfred Dodini. He saw the boys and he gave them fire starting tools. He talked to Amy's mom and dad and he wrote down whatever they said. He had never conversed with me, never had talked to me. I'd never met him. It caused a big problem and he wrote a letter to the judge. I called Dr. Alfred Dodini. Then I asked him for the records, which he was statutorily bound to give me but he refused. I filed a complaint against him with the Behavioral Board of Health Examiners. When we walked into the room, he went into a seizure. None of the board members knew what to do, but I did. Cleared a spot for him, and I took care of him until the paramedics came. The board decided to move on because, of course, he had a medical event. So about five minutes later, he walked back in the room and he said to the board, no, I want to finish it. The quote, I want to finish this. And they said, okay, are you sure? And he said, yes, I'm sure. The first things out of his mouth was, this is a horrible man. He treats his children. He's a sociopath, whatever he said. And they said, are you kidding me? He just helped you. You were, see you know, having a seizure. So at the end of that day, he walked in with two counts against him, and he walked out with 17 that the board levied against him. The board demanded that his license be revoked for the rest of his life. So the court knew that there was a complaint that had been filed, did not investigate on why, and when it was brought up, didn't want to listen to it. October of 2009, really good friend of mine, 
had an aunt that was a legislator, a senator. And he also knew Amy. And he was discussed. I'm speaking for him, but it seemed as though he was disgusted. So he introduced me to his aunt. His aunt and I sat down and we went over it. I went in with a piece of paper writing down what I thought. If both parents are found to be capable and fit, then the judge shall not order sole custody. It was a amended, reamended. It was changed um, with the help of David Goss and Bruce Cohen. We helped change the language that is now ARS 25103. Even on video, you can see the court fought it. Uh, the Anti-Domestic Violence Coalition fought it. As a matter of fact, when I stepped out of the room, they started yelling at me, telling me I had no business writing legislation with, without getting their input first. You know, one time I had to drag Senator Allen away from people that were attacking her. Senator Allen was my um, pillar because she believed in me. Uh, ARS 25103 is very special to me because I called it Ammon's Law. It reminded me of Ammon because at that time I was seeing the two boys, but I still hadn't seen Ammon. ARS 25103. Substantial, frequent, meaningful, and continuing parent. It means that from now on, the rest of the title has to be written after. Right, like that, that's the main uh, spirit of any order yes. in family court. Yes. It is declared that the public policy of this state and the general purposes of this title are to promote strong families, to promote strong family values. It is also declared public policy of this state and the general purpose of this title. Absent evidence to the contrary, it is in a child's best interest to have substantial, frequent, meaningful and continuing parenting time with both parents to have both parents participate in decision making about the child a court shall apply the provisions of this title in a manner that is consistent with this section the reason there's so many profound things that are mentioned and is they're not profound they're obvious they're only profound to the people who have bought into the way the system is. And that means that the system itself is corrupt. I think a way to frame this question real quick. Public policy. Um, Maybe you shouldn't frame it. Where do you want to go? This is when I got divorced. That's what I look like. And now look at me. <laughs> This right here is December 29th, 2010, somewhere around there. <clears throat> this is the last picture and the last time I saw my son Ammon. There was no high conflict in our marriage. And then all of a sudden there was a high conflict in the divorce. I was a great dad all through my marriage. And then suddenly I became a horrible father. I talk to God every day. You know, I work. One of the reasons I work and work and work is so that I can work by myself, so that I can talk to God. So I always carry an earpiece in my ear so that if people walk in and I'm talking to myself, I can just point at the earpiece saying I'm on the phone. <laughs> you know, I don't want to admit it that PTSD has played a big part in this. I don't want to admit it because I don't want to be that person that has PTSD. At the same time, I recognize that there are a lot of the same symptoms. I think that when you go to battle, whether it be in a military zone or any type of theater, or you go into the family court system, it's a battle you're gonna wind up with PTSD. Judges, they don't care. The children wind up with PTSD. So when you get these children, the first thing 
that I look at, are they from a broken home? And the majority, vast majority of them are fatherless homes. Just ask yourself if they come from a fatherless home. This is the pandemic of America. It all starts with people who shirk accountability, who don't want it. So they don't think that they have to be accountable to anything. It doesn't happen because we have special interest groups who receive billions of dollars to make it otherwise so that we can keep the conflict going for money. Here we are raking these people over the coals, telling them they need a, a parenting coordinator and a guardian ad litem, psychologist, a, a child attorney, all of these core professionals so that the judge can make a decision. Why do we even have judges if they can't make a decision? It's not to make the best decision. If it's to make the best decision, then they would just say, all right, you have uh, one month. And then we're going to have a status conference and we're going to make a decision there. But they don't. They just keep it going. Raking in the money. The court has no idea what's in the best interest of the child. The parents do. Maybe they disagree. But in the end, they're both thinking about the child. The court doesn't know anything about it. Like I said before, the courts, the judges, have never changed a diaper on your child. They don't even know what your child's favorite color is. They don't know how many times your child has been sick. They don't know your child's immunization record, who your child's favorite aunt is. They don't know your child's favorite sayings. They don't know how your child likes to cuddle up against you in a certain spot and mom in a certain spot. They don't know the traditions of family. You don't have custody. You never will. It's the court that decides. You just get, you just get to practice um, custody so that the court doesn't have to do everything. But they're the ones that have custody of your children, not you. The things I go over are, they're redundant. Everybody knows that they happen. But you never know what really happens until it happens to you. As soon as you sign those papers to go to court for a divorce, for child custody, you make the court the final decision maker in your case. I will tell you that corruption is absolute power. And absolute power corrupts. Thank you.